It's finally here, my overview of the Inferno Deluxe hardcover from Marvel Comics. So, please stay tuned. Before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this deluxe hardcover. This deluxe hardcover is due out in the direct market and book market on April 19th. And what we're looking at here is the standard edition cover. On the left hand side is your direct market cover. And the direct market cover, of course, is only available at your local comic book shop or places like CheapGraphicNovels.com, WaltzComicShop.com, Dying Break Collectors, In Stock Trades, DCBS, Tales of Wonder, Organic Price Books, uh, places like that. But let's take a closer look at this cover since this is the one that we have. So here we have a cover featuring Moria McTaggart. Ah! I love it. I've been waiting to read this for so long. Um, actually, I've been waiting to talk about this for almost a month now since I read this hardcover. And it's going to be a little difficult to talk about this without spoilers. So there will be some spoilers. I'll let you know ahead of time when I'm going to be talking about it. Of course, there's a quote. The design of this is just... I, I love the design of these books. I think they're awesome and they stand out on your shelf. So the thing about these trade paperbacks or hardcovers is that no matter what whenever you're looking at your shelf you get to a certain point and you're like oh we've reached a whole new age of x-men just based on the design of those spines and of course the books themselves i've always compared them to something like textbooks and yeah it's it the, i i happen to like them i think they stand out i'm not sure what the consensus is on these but me personally, I think they're really cool. Uh, this one here is bright orange, which you're going to see here when we look under the dust jacket. But first, I wanted to assure you that it is as tall as an omnibus. This is a deluxe hardcover. So it's an OHC, oversized hardcover. And it is as tall as an omnibus. So it will match with X of Swords, Hellfire Gala, X-Men Omnibus by Jonathan Hickman, House and Powers of X, just to kind of give you an idea. Now, underneath the dust jacket, this is what I mean by orange. It's this neon orange look to it. Inferno. And then the back of the book. So... Let's crack this book open, check out this artwork, and talk about the story. Again, I'll let you know when I'm about to hit spoilers. Alright, so let's get this open. Very, very epic with these black end paper. And, of course, the symbol that they've been using for a long time for the recent era of X-Men. Uh, this book just contains Inferno 1-4, through 4. however, it has 224 pages. Because I think each issue of Inferno, at least I know the first and the last, were giant-sized. Inferno, written by Jonathan Hickman. Valerio Schetti is uh, the artist on issue number one. Issue number two is Stefano Caselli. R.B. Silva, Stefano Caselli, and Valerio Schetti are the uh, artists on issue number three. And then wrapping it up is Valerio Schetti with Stefano Caselli. David Curiel doing the color. So... Before I talk about this and do an overview of this, it's going to be really difficult. Uh, so right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give just a little bit of a spoiler of the premise of House and Powers of X. So just in case you haven't read it, um, you know, I really don't know what you're doing here if you haven't read it yet and you're watching this. But uh, thank you, I guess. If you don't care about spoilers, I guess you're also welcome to stay. But just in case you haven't read that, I'm going to spoil just a little something. All right, all you brave souls. Pretty much the only thing I'm going to say is the whole revelation that happened in the pages of House of X number two with Moira having been this mutant, a mutant that gets reincarnated and remembers her past lives. And right now, because of the events that happened in House and Powers of X, we are on Moira X, or the 10th life of Moira McTaggart. So since that miniseries, she's been hiding in this little secluded area of Krakoa. So this all takes place after that. And if you're going to ask me when to best read this, read it after the X-Men Omnibus by Jonathan Hickman. Uh, you can read this before or after the X-Fire, or the X-Fire, X-Men Hellfire Gala. But definitely after X of Swords and X-Men by Jonathan Hickman. 
I'm probably gonna, once the rest of the OHCs come out, like Hellions and X-Force, I will probably do a reading order of just the deluxe hardcover collections on how to read Reign of X and Dawn of X, and probably, you know what, I'll probably also do the collections of the trade paperbacks too, just in case people get them in that way. So it opens up with this, something very similar that happened in the House of X story, which is... Another thing I have to spoil about that particular era is that mutants can now come back to life through the process of five mutants and their memories can be restored. Uh, so this is very similar to Professor Xavier, you know, accepting a couple of mutants that had just died. You can read who they were there, but it's a big, it's kind of a big surprise what happens in one of the particular issues. But this time, however, it's Emma Frost and she says, what is it you like to say at times like this? Charles, to me, my X-Men. So we both see what I assume is Professor X and Magnus, their uh, Magneto, coming back to life. And of course, it's Jonathan Hickman. You just get thrown into the middle of a story that could have been taking place in the past, in the future. We don't really know until we get in here uh, and start reading about this. So this is pretty much a direct sequel to House and Powers of X. And I'm going to go ahead and answer the question that I'm sure I'm going to be asked a lot is, do, uh, do you need to have even read Excalibur, Marauders, Wolverine, Cable, X of Swords to understand what's happening here? If you had just read, read House and Powers of X? No, not at all. You don't really need to even read X-Men. I know it's coming from the guy that calls himself Uncanny X-Men. But this is a direct sequel to House and Powers of X. Everything that they were setting up in those stories are playing out here. And, I mean, everything. The the coming of Nimrod, and I'm not going to go into spoilers about that. Or, what's going on with Moira? What is it about the precogs and destiny that she fears? That she, And where does that go from here? And, now, I do have to talk about this book. So... I do have to talk about some spoilers. Not a lot. Not how or what happens. But just a little bit of spoilers. Um, in case anybody doesn't want to know anything, maybe we'll watch this video afterwards. Because I'm going to be talking now about spoilers of Inferno. Now, this is not to be confused with X-Men Inferno, right? That's a big difference. That was an event that featured the clone of Jean Grey, uh, Madeline Pryor, becoming the Goblin Queen. Hell on Earth, pretty much. This really doesn't have anything to do with that. Really, the quote, I think, basically comes from Destiny, who plays a big part in this. And it's the, there, there will be an island. And this is what Destiny was saying to Mystique. Not the first, but the last. This place will seem to be hope for our kind. When those days come, remember these words. Bring me back. And if you cannot, if they will not then burn that place to the ground. So this is a promise between Destiny and Mystique. Now, of course, being an X-Men completist and a historian that I am, of course I would tell you to read all this books like, you know, the stories of Mystique and Destiny and how they were really a couple long before they ever said they were. I mean, Chris Claremont was hinting at that strongly. And I'm sure at the time they just couldn't do it. But now it's canon that Mystique and Destiny were not just a couple, but they were also married and together. So this goes back again to that big story arc in House of X, where it's revealed uh, that Mora has lived 10 times. And in one of those lifetimes, where she's trying to like get rid of mutant kind because she thinks that's the only way to fix things, you know, Destiny and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants stop her. And this is where you get more of an expanded scene. This is where you see the things that they're really telling each other. And it's kind of freaky. Because Destiny lays it out pretty much that, well, you only have 10 lives. That means I'm coming for you. If you do this, we're going to come and get you. We're going to remember. Because she's a precog, no matter what lifetime. It's pretty interesting how this plays out. And that threat, right? Because Moira doesn't know if she only has 10 lives or if she will have more. I mean, she could try. But the ramification of trying is uh, you're either dead or you could come back to life and be reincarnated. We don't know yet. I love these alternate timeline stories. They're a lot different than uh, the stories like in Excalibur and Captain Britain uh, with the multiverse stories, those type, those type of stories. The, these are different than that. Uh, I don't know if we're ever going to see any of those other multiple uh, timelines come back. 
uh, from the pages of House and Powers of X. I would love to see that possible future. So let's skip here a little bit. Another big player in all of this is the character of Cypher, Doug Ramsey, who is brought to the island early on. You start seeing flashbacks, by the way, here of Professor Xavier and Magneto building this island slowly. And Doug Ramsey is one of the people that they bring in early on to kind of start building a language with Krakoa, start building a rapport with Krakoa. And of course, Doug can't go alone, not without his self-friend Warlock. So Warlock is there with Doug. They spend time with Krakoa. They learn of Arako. Uh, we see the building of the council, the inner council, which is all corrupt, of course. But one of the biggest things that happens, and I love the way that this is all plays out, and I promise this will be the last spoiler because I want people to enjoy this, um, is Professor Xavier and Magneto have a meeting with Moira. Moira is like, look, I don't care what it takes. No matter what, you put an end to her. She cannot come back. And of course, she's talking about Destiny. So in this, you get to find out why she's had this fear of precog, especially Destiny, mainly because of that scene. She tells Professor Xavier and Magneto that she will destroy all this unless they make her a promise that they will destroy any chance of Destiny ever coming back, whether it's her DNA, no matter where the DNAs are stored there to destroy it, her memories from uh, Cerebro supposed to be destroyed. So they're like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. Of course, of course, they want to keep Moira happy because <laughs> she's kind of the ones that, because uh, she's the main reason this island kind of came to be. Now, this is their utopia, right? And with the, in this utopia, we have the council. And in this, I love how this is all manipulated by both Magneto and Xavier. Both of them playing at their strengths here. We get to see a manipulative side of both of them. And it's not unique to this story. It's not even unique to this Hickman era. We've seen that before, both in Magneto and in Xavier. More so in Magneto. Uh, but they manipulate Cyclops into stepping down, and they're talking about how the council can always be replaced. And this is their way of replacing Mystique. So they can completely destroy Destiny. However, well, first let's talk about this. So Cyclops steps down. And in his place steps up Bishop. All right, we're one step closer. Now they want to vote out Mystique. But before they can do that, they have to vote someone else in. Psylocke is stepping in for uh, Gorgon, who kind of... I guess you have to read a little bit of Ten of Swords to understand why, but... Not really necessary. So they need one more council member. And the, the last, again, spoiler I'll talk about. Lo and behold, Mystique says, I have somebody in mind. And we can vote them in right now. And that, of course, is none other than the love of her life. Destiny. Now, you can find out exactly how all that happens. How if Professor Xavier... May, what does that mean for Moira? Is she going to betray them? Is she going to burn this to the ground? Or is Destiny going to burn this world to the ground? I think I've talked enough about the spoilers of this. Um, let me focus on a little bit of the artwork here. One of the most interesting things is how the colors all bring this together. Like Steph uh, Stefano Caselli has a very different art style than R.B. Silva or uh, Valerio Schitti. To me, he R.B. Silva... Uh, Pepe de la Raz and uh, Valeria Schitti have what I've always called the um, Stuart Eminent type of art. And it they can they they do they do vary. Like you, you can definitely tell when it's Pepe de la Raz instead of RB Silva. But it's so similar to that I think most people would say, oh, it's the same artist. But Stefano Caselli actually has a different style, but it kind of looks like everybody else's artwork because of the colors. And I think that's what brings it all together. Now you're going to find memos in here, journal entries, just like your regular Hickman type of story. Or the Krakoa Age of X-Men. It's going to be scientific experiments being done that don't make any sense at first. But then they do later on. And you're like, oh, this is how it all makes uh, perfect sense now. Oh, uh, this is how it all comes together. The Orcus Forge comes back, so we do see the return of the Omega Sentinel. And what could be, maybe, the beginning of Nimrod? This is what I was hoping to see a long time ago. And I know, you know, Jonathan Hickman plays the long game. And I don't know if he's going to come back. I know he said he had other ideas, and there are a lot of other stories just from the original miniseries of House and Powers of X that need some tying up. Um, so it's interesting reading this because it does feel like the book end to his X-Men, even though there are some things that are left open. 
but it feels like he's also handing the keys over to other writers and saying, you know, get creative with this. I'm giving you pretty much the stepping stones to get there to an amazing story. It's your job to get everybody over there to that particular story. Good journey. But I don't know. It feels like an ending, but it's an open ending. I mean, we're still stu we're still in this Krakoan era of X Men. We still have a lot of questions that need answers, and he is still in charge of like he is still part of the uh, brain trust of the X Men. So I don't know how much that plays into all of this. I don't know if that's just Jonathan Hickman's name can be written on a credit, and he just gets a check, or if he actually has some input. It'd be pretty interesting to know that. Uh, now, Jonathan Hickman did say he's got one more uh, work that he's going to be doing for Marvel Comics. Uh, don't know if that's X-Men related. Be cool if he's got like an actual ending to this, or if that's Spider-Man or Captain America. Really, it's Jonathan Hickman can pretty much do whatever he wants to. Um, but I would be really interested to know if it's got to do anything with X-Men or not. Now, I love the ending of this, and I would love to know if you've read it. Oh, you know, man, maybe I should do an old reader, new reader with Maddie just to talk about this with people and really go into spoilers. But if you've read it, let me know in the comments what you think of that ending, because I think it's perfect. The way that it's set up, uh, the twists, because that Moira, or I'm sorry, that Destiny twist was not even the only twist in here. There are a lot more twists. Now, as far as the extras in the back, we've got that Inferno variant. Of course, this is the direct market variant by Mark Brooks. We got, whoa, what is going on there, Mystique? I see you, Raven. Woo. I'm not so much into the hairy arm thing, but that by Art Germ, my goodness. Peach Momoko, and we still have some thumbnail artwork. Even this, I guess this is a, oh, okay, this is a Greg Capullo one. A hidden gem. That is a nice piece right there. David Aha, Russell Dodderman, of course, that is gorgeous. Always been a fan of that. I used to have those uh, Marvel Masterpieces, the trading cards. Some more thumbnails. But I, I prefer the splash pages, so they're beautiful. Again, the book has 224 pages. Let's talk about this binding. It is glued binding. So this is printed at the Sheridan Printer in Versailles, Kentucky. I don't live in that town anymore, but... Uh, so it's very similar to those hardcovers that have had this particular type of binding with the glue but at 224 pages it's not that bad i mean you are going to get some gutter loss compared to something with sewn binding that's why most of us that have been collecting these type of collected editions prefer to sewn binding let me see if i can find a spread page without spoilers you know the way the way that jonathan hickman writes he really doesn't like spread pages but I know he loves his splash pages. But this is the way the book lays over. It tries to open up a little bit because, like I said, the glued binding. Um, so, not really any spread pages towards the beginning. Or the first two issues. So you're not really getting any loss in art because there's no yeah, gutter loss with any spread pages. And this is the way that it lays over towards the back. Again, you're going to have to hold that down. Um, yeah, I mean, got a little bit of a gutter curve there. Just the way the book lays over, but honestly, it's pretty good. I've seen some binding that's had more gutter loss. Um, the far as the paper quality, it is thick, glossy paper that they are using in this. Feels like the old Donley uh, printer paper. And for those of you wondering where I'm going to be putting my book in the oversized hardcover shelf, right here on the end, because I think everything leads to this. It's just perfectly fits right here that as they say is that if you're interested in purchasing this book don't forget to check out our sponsor cheapgraphicnovels.com your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50 percent off cover price they have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service check out their bargain deals for up to 90 percent off cover price and don't forget that cgn also takes pre-orders that way you don't miss out on the hottest releases and they are currently running a special promotion for you minties if you're a first time customer after receiving your order confirmation email reply back to that email and let them know near mint condition sent you their way they will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the u.s cheap graphic novels your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more and that was the content the page count and build of this hardcover 
Let me know in the comments down below if you've read the story already, what you think about it, if you are picking it up, if this is your first time reading this story, and where you hope these stories go as far as X-Men. Do you hope that Jonathan Hickman comes back one more time to wrap up all the loose ends that he started with House and Powers? I'd love to see the return of that possible Nimrod future myself. This was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. If you have any questions, leave your questions in the comment section. Everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Thank you to our existing patrons. Could not be making videos like this possible without you all. And much love.